One other topic that's very popular this time of year is Roth conversions. Uh, so those have to be completed by the end of December. And if you're unfamiliar with a Roth conversion, it's basically taking funds from your traditional IRA and rolling it over into a Roth IRA account. So you're paying income tax now, uh, maybe you're in a lower tax bracket than you assume you will be in future years. So then those funds, once they're in the Roth IRA, they can grow tax-free uh, and then you can use them as you please. Uh, so talk to your advisor about that, especially if you don't have a Roth IRA set up yet. That's something that we'd want to get set up for you as soon as possible. Uh, and then, of course, do some analysis on how much of a Roth conversion makes sense for you. Well, hello and welcome to episode 11 of Aprium Financial Sense. In today's episode, I sit with uh, Megan Schwab, who is one of our financial planners here at Aprium Advisors, and she's going to give us a very well thought out year end checklist as we reach the end of 2023 here. Hope you enjoy. Thank you, Josh. Uh, yeah, so the first one is uh, definitely take your RMD if you're age 73 or above. Um, it must be taken by December 31st of this year. So if you haven't taken that yet, certainly talk to your advisor uh, about getting those funds out to you um, before the end of the year. Okay. There is a caveat though, um, for individuals who turned 73 in 2023, they can actually delay their RMD until April 1st of 2024. Uh, something to keep in mind with that, though, is that you'll still be on the hook for your 2024 RMD. So taxes may be a bit higher if you choose to uh, delay. Um, so, so, so essentially, yeah. you could end up taking two RMDs in the same year? Exactly. Yes. So uh, maybe it's a situation that applies to you, but I'd encourage you, as always, to talk to your advisor uh, to see if, if that would be a scenario you find yourself in. So I think probably a lot of the folks that are on are, are already familiar with and have been taking their, you know, their annual RMDs. But for those who this is going to be their first time around, or maybe it's coming up in the next year or two, do you want to give a little kind of synopsis of exactly what an RMD actually is? Sure. So an RMD stands for a required minimum distribution. Uh, so basically, you've been saving into your 401k all these years or your IRA, uh, and that that money that you put in is tax deferred. So you didn't pay taxes when the money was put into your account and it's been growing this whole time without paying any tax. Uh, so Uncle Sam is saying at age 73, <laughs> he's had enough, he wants his fair share. So you have to take uh, that required minimum distribution. And that's calculated for you based on the account value as of December 31st of the previous year. Uh, and then it takes it into consideration things like your age uh, and how much the account balance was. And so um, do do folks have to uh, take that all at one time at the end of the year each year? I mean, what's kind of the rule as far as taking the withdrawal? So that part's pretty flexible, which is nice. Uh, so we have some some individuals who choose to take it as a monthly distribution to supplement their living expenses. And then we have others who would prefer to just take the lump sum uh, near the end of the year. So that that's really a personal preference uh, as well. And what happens if somebody doesn't take their required minimum distribution? So what happens if you don't take it at all or don't take enough, there's a 25% excise tax on the amount not taken. Uh, they actually, the IRS actually lowered that uh, from previous years. Um, but if you correct the mistake in a timely manner, the IRS may lower that excise tax to just 10%. No one really knows what a timely manner means. So <laughs> it may just be the luck of the draw if your, your penalty gets lowered. But currently, those are the rules around uh, what happens if you don't take it out in time. Right. And that whole amount is taxable in general. So you're paying your regular ordinary income tax plus that excise tax. So that can be pretty hefty. Mm -hmm. um, so... It, it, oftentimes, if somebody's missing um, that their RMD, it's probably because they didn't need or want the money or the withdrawal to begin with. Um, so what happens in the case of somebody that has to take this, um, uh, but but they don't want or need the withdrawal, they don't need the income, do they have any kind of uh, solutions or things that they could do with those dollars? Are they required to just spend it? There are a few options. 
Uh, the first is you could you'd still have to pay the income tax on the on withdrawing from the account, uh, but you could put it into a taxable brokerage if you really don't need those funds immediately, and those can continue to grow in the brokerage account. Of course, once it's in a taxable brokerage, you'll be subject to tax uh, capital gains tax. So just something to think about. If you really don't need the money and maybe you're feeling uh, charitable, uh, you can do what's called a qualified charitable distribution. And so that's available for individuals who are over age 70 and a half. So you don't necessarily have to be at that RMD age yet to take advantage of this. But basically what it means is you can pull from your IRA and contribute directly to a charity of your choice. And that contribution you've made to the charity uh, counts towards your required minimum distribution for the year. Uh, so one, you get to help a charity that means something to you, but then also it lowers your tax impact, and then maybe you're, you're off the hook for an RMD that year. Again, that all depends on things like your account value and how much your RMD is in the first place, so certainly talk to your CPA uh, or advisor about that. Okay, very good. And so I think that sounds like probably a pretty pretty good segue into the next item that I happen to know is on your checklist there, and that comes to um, uh, charitable donations. Yes, so uh, get those charitable donations in. Uh, I will say the sooner you do it, the better. Uh, just again, because processing times at the end of the year for not Aprium per se, but for other uh, companies can take a bit longer. So to avoid any extra stress around the holidays, uh, I would do that sooner rather than later, but you can uh, contribute directly from your bank account uh, if that's how you prefer to contribute funds uh, to a charity. If you have a donor advised fund, uh, you can consider uh, giving to a charity from that fund or uh, contributing to your donor advised fund uh, directly to get that contribution in for the year. Uh, just a quick reminder that when you contribute to a donor advised fund that counts as a donation, even though it hasn't been given to a charity yet so you'd get the tax uh, benefit in the year that you contributed to that donor advised fund. Do you want to talk a little bit about you know, specifically what a donor advised fund is. So a donor advised fund is basically this pool of money that you set aside and save and you can choose to distribute it to various charities of your choice. Uh, so say in 2023, I'm going to contribute to my donor advised fund, but I want that money to grow for a few years before I consider giving it to a charity. Uh, so what happens is in 2023, the year I contribute to my donor advised fund, I'll get the tax benefit as if I actually contributed to a charity, when in reality, that money is just siloed uh, for a future date when I choose uh, a charity that I want to give all or a portion of the funds to. So that's an option. Um, you can also gift stock uh, directly to specific charities if they accept that. Uh, some benefits of gifting stock rather than uh, just cash is you don't have to pay any capital gains tax on the appreciation of your stock. Uh, the fair market value may be itemized um, as an income tax deduction uh, on your tax return. And then there's some other rules around that, but those are very personal. So I, I would certainly talk to your CPA or advisor as well. Um, okay. If that's something you're interested in. Very good. Is that something that you, when you're, when you're um, donating, let's say stock, do you do, can you do that directly out of the donor advised fund? You can, and you can also do it directly from, you know, a taxable brokerage if you, if you choose sure. as well. So uh, I would, I would say doing it out of a uh, taxable brokerage may be a bit better. That's when you'd see the tax benefit a bit more directly. If you do it from your donor advised fund, that money has already had the tax benefit. All right. So we've talked a little bit about uh, making sure we get our year end required minimum distributions done if we haven't already finished it for the year. Um, mm -hmm. That now is about the time that if we're going to do uh, charitable donations. Let's get that going, even if it's just to your own donor advised fund. Um, get it done a little bit ahead of time because it could get into crunch time as it gets in, you know, right, right towards the end of the year there and you don't want to miss, miss the cutoff. Mm -hmm. um, okay, any other items on that checklist for us as we, we, we finish off the year here? Yeah, so I would certainly look at your 401k employee retirement contributions. 
um, contributions to your 401k for 2023 have to be completed in 2023. So maybe if you've talked to your advisor about raising your contribution rate this year or having a certain dollar amount contributed by the end of the year, if that hasn't been done yet, uh, maybe talk to your employer and see if you can raise that contribution rate for those last few paychecks of 2023. Uh, something to note that Roth IRA and traditional IRA contributions uh, for 2023 don't have to be completed until tax day of 2024. So that's a nice benefit, uh, but of course, still something to keep in mind on uh, how much you want to be contributing so you can plan for that in the coming months. One other topic that's very popular this time of year is Roth conversions. Uh, so those have to be completed by the end of December. And if you're unfamiliar with a Roth conversion, it's basically taking funds from your traditional IRA and rolling it over into a Roth IRA account. So you're paying income tax now, uh, maybe you're in a lower tax bracket than you assume you will be in future years. So then those funds, once they're in the Roth IRA, they can grow tax free uh, and then you can use them as you please. Uh, so talk to your advisor about that, especially if you don't have a Roth IRA set up yet. That's something that we'd want to get set up for you as soon as possible. Uh, and then, of course, do some analysis on how much of a Roth conversion makes sense for you. Yeah, I, I, this is one of those those kind of key planning opportunities that we see that's out there uh, specifically for folks who are retiring now or have just recently retired so their income levels have dropped quite substantially right and so we went from working we had a tax bracket that was higher from all of this this working income that we were receiving now we're retired the income levels have come way down um but we're not at required minimum distribution age yet mm -hmm. right and so we're not being forced to take any withdrawals off of our off of our iras or 401ks our retirement accounts exactly. and so it gives us a great opportunity to Go ahead and say, hey, let's take advantage of the fact that I'm in a lower tax bracket now that I retire and have less income. I'll do my conversion at this lower tax rate, um, and I can do it each year a little bit at a time until I get to that required minimum distribution age. And now all those those taxable retirement accounts, the value, values have come way down, and it makes my my um, my RMDs um, and tax bites at that time um less right or more reasonable any any other items that we want to want to make sure we address we talked about uh, retirement contributions right as well as Roth conversions and the opportunity that exists there mm -hmm. yeah so uh, there's a few around non-retirement saving so uh, personally I think it's always a good idea near the end of the year to sit down and look at your savings goals uh, was there a savings goal you set in January of this year that you wanted to meet um, have you met it um, if so, that's great. You're ahead of schedule. And if not, figure out why. Maybe some unexpected items came up that you had to pay for uh, and weren't planning on. Uh, but now is always a good time to just review those goals uh, and compare them to where you're at now and maybe even set up a new goal for, for the new year. Um, and while we're on saving, maybe some people want to be uh, saving for their kids or grandkids, putting money away into uh, their you know, their kids' uh, savings accounts or college savings accounts. Uh, now's the time to think about doing that as well. Uh, there's what's called an annual gift exclusion. Uh, so basically what that means is there's a certain amount I can give to someone uh, without having to report it on my tax return. Uh, so that amount for 2023 is $17,000. Uh, so, you know, if you, are consistently giving into your your kids accounts uh, just consider where you're at compared to the uh, annual gift exclusion maybe talk to your advisor if you are wanting to give more than that in a in a given year and we can help you there and so is that seventeen thousand um, dollar amount is that based on the individual that is gifting it, I can gift $17,000 or the person that's receiving it, I can only receive $17,000 as a gift each year. So it's based on how much I give to an individual. So say I have three kids, I can give mm -hmm. each of them $17,000 in 2023, and I would be under the annual gift exclusion. Okay. Um, and then so your spouse could also do the same, right? Exactly. 
Mm -hmm. So as the recipient, if you have several people trying to take advantage of this <laughs> exclusion and gift you money, you're in a pretty good spot. <laughs> um, but yes, so it's it's uh, per recipient. And as the, the gift or I can I can give to several different recipients in a given year. Okay, so I just have a, a few more. Um, maybe review and update your estate plan, whether or not there are big events that happen during the year. Um, I peg this goal to do at year end just because it's something that you can easily remember to do in your year end mm -hmm. checklist. Um, if any updates need to be made, maybe consider making an appointment with your estate planning attorney uh, at the turn of the year uh, to get that updated. Um, perhaps start thinking about any goals or large financial events that you're anticipating for the new year communicate that with your advisor because maybe it'll require uh, an investment strategy change that we can start thinking and talking about uh, on when best to make that change. Uh, and then finally, schedule your year-end review to, to go over how things uh, went in 2023 with, with your advisor. Uh, it's a great time to catch up and set goals for the new year. Okay. Well, that's perfect. I think that that's a very solid checklist and gives everyone some good items to think about as we go into the end of the year here. Um, if you need help going through that, schedule an appointment. I mean, you should be having those year-end reviews and, and scheduling those meetings now anyway, just to talk about how things have gone this year. Megan, you mentioned a number of times, has there been any changes that have occurred over the past 12 months, right? Now's the time to really go through and say, hey, you know, we're, we're having a baby, right? Or maybe, um, uh, you know, somebody else in the family just had a new child or, you know, unfortunately, maybe maybe there was a death in the family that occurred or we acquired some new property, right, that needs to get added into the trust, right? So are there, you know, uh, updates or changes that need to be made there? So, um, so anyway, uh, schedule an appointment with your advisor, get those year end reviews in and um, uh, thank you everyone for a wonderful 2023. Great. Thank you, Josh. <laughs>